Welcome back, everybody. This is Eric and Matt, and this is Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit, your beacon of freedom and the American way of life. Tune in every Friday for a new episode as we dive into the world of liberty and what makes our country great. All right, guys, welcome back. Matt and Eric here with Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit. Hello. And we are back in action here with our LLP podcast, and I appreciate you guys being patient with us. We did have a lapse uh, in content. I apologize. We've all been uh, sort of on vacation doing a couple of things, so oh, yeah. we didn't have the opportunity to uh, get some episodes cut, but we're back. And uh, today we're going get, to be getting back into the saddle here with, uh, we're going to be talking about is balkanization on the horizon for the United States? Now, this video is going to, and podcast, is going to go into a couple of different directions here, mm -hmm. and we're going to definitely get into it. And I think that you'll be intrigued by some of the things we're going to cover. I hope you'll stick around and uh, have some fun with today's podcast. Uh, how's things going with you, man? Man, I am super, super excited to be back in the studio. We've been gone for quite a while on vacation and doing our own thing. It's taken some much needed time off. So we appreciate the viewers. You guys sent us a ton of messages worried. Hey, where's the latest episode at? And it's been, you know, quite a bit, but we're, we're getting back in there. We're, we're doing some great content. Uh, before we get started today, I wanted to talk about the show sponsor Express VPN. Uh, I know that if you're like me or like Eric, you take your online search history um, very seriously. You want to make sure that it's kept private and is not being sold uh, to the highest bidder to force feed you ads. So I know most of you are probably thinking, why don't you just use um, incognito mode or some type of uh, tool on your search engine? Those don't hide uh, the data that goes to your ISP. ExpressVPN does. It's 100% encrypted end to end. So your data stays private and you don't have to worry about prying eyes looking into what you're looking at. It's an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure service. So your ISP can't see the sites you visit. 100% of your data is encrypted with the most powerful encryption available. Uh, most of the time when I'm using it, I don't even notice it's on. It, I open my web browser, it automatically connects and you're good to go. They also have an app on the phone. So you click the ExpressVPN button on your phone, your browser opens up and you're protected. Anything you're looking for on your phone is protected. You're good to go. It's available on all your devices, including your smart TV. So if you have a smart TV and you're worried about, you know, searching stuff on your smart TV, it's protected as well. Guys, protect your online activity today with a VPN that's rated number one by CNET and Wired. Get three months free when you sign up. Visit our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash LLP. That's E X P R E S S VPN.com slash L L P Express VPN.com slash L L P. All right, Eric. So um, let's get into it, man. I got we, this is going to be a great conversation. Yeah. You know, we've been thinking about different concepts. We have been brainstorming and stuff, trying to come up with some other um, L L P concepts. We do plan on having more guests as well. So I hope you guys will be patient with us on that. Um, before we get started, you know, I, we did get a couple of comments from people that were saying, hey, uh, put the uh, windscreens a little lower, whatever the pop filters, <laughs> so that we can see your faces. So we tried to accommodate y'all on that. Yeah, we um, moved some stuff around to make it a little bit yeah. friendlier for you guys. We are looking to uh, upgrade our podcast setup uh, in the future. So bear with us on that. We're trying to put out the best product possible for y'all. And we hope you'll uh, bear with us on that. So, balkanization. This is a really weird subject, right? It, it goes into a lot of different things, and unless you've been living under a rock, you know, here in the United States, things have been a little hairy these last couple of years. There's been a lot of tensions uh, that are flaring, you know, different emotions are flaring with people, uh, lots of different ideologies and concepts are, you know, definitely a little bit more forward and a little bit more out there than what they have traditionally been in the past. Um not to mention all the widespread uh, violence and lots of crazy things that are going on. And, you know, I, I don't want to make this podcast necessarily political per se, but we're just looking at sort of the underlying concepts that involve balkanization. So it's probably worth starting out by let's just sort of define what it means to balkanize for a given country. So perfect. Um, this is from Wikipedia, but this mm -hmm. does uh, give a pretty nice synopsis. I'll just go down the list here. Um, so basically, balkanization involves the fragmentation of a larger region or state into smaller regions or states, which may be hostile or uncooperative with one another. 
The root causes of balkanization are usually differences of ethnicity, culture, and religion, and some other factors such as past grievances. When sponsored or encouraged by a sovereign third party, the term has been used as an accusation against such third party nations. Controversially, the item is also often used by voices for the status quo to underscore the dangers of a runaway successionism. So successionism and balkanization sort of go hand in hand in this definition. So we know about succession because we know about the southern states succeeding from the Union uh, during the Civil War around 1860 or so and the whole Confederacy and everything that led up to that. Now, we're not going to get into the minutia and the politics of how people feel about that situation, but it is worth noting that it's not the first time in our history where we've been kind of unsure about where we're going to move forward as a nation, right? So it is a scary concept. You know, we, we're grown up and we're taught as Americans coming up in our society to care about one another and to understand where each other's positions are and to, you know, sometimes we may not always agree on everything. But that's what makes America such a unique environment, that we are a melting pot of different cultures, mm -hmm. different et ethnicities, uh, different religions, and everything like that. So I think it's clear for me to mention and, and to make clear uh, in this uh, particular podcast that we're not saying that we are for uh, balkanization or against balkanization. We're simply laying out some things that might be uh, food for thought for people to kind of come up with their own uh, individual thoughts as to how they feel about the concept. Um, I think that a nation that is, let's just say united, right? We're the United States of America. Let's just look at like the, the, the name of our country, the United States of America. That's the most anti-balkanization type of name you could think of, right? We are united, right? right? Uh, and even under the vein of balkanization, right, uh, you know, one could even argue, well, well, wait a minute, y'all have these 50 states already from the get-go, right? Uh, you know, the nation that we know it uh, today, we have all these different states. Well, couldn't that be a form of balkanization? Well, the answer is no, because we're a constitutional republic. And you hear all this stuff get thrown around about uh, democracy and things like that. Sure, there is a democracy element to a constitutional republic, but it's not strict democracy. You know, we have the Electoral College, we have checks and balances, we have a very unique government that, in my opinion, um, if ran completely to the letter of what its original intentions are, is a pretty dang perfect situation uh, that will benefit most of the citizens in the, in the best way possible. The issue is because of the rampant fraud and everything that's gone on. And we're not talking about just, let's just say, election fraud or anything like that. We're not getting down that rabbit hole. But when we look at the miscarriage of our republic, the way it's being handled, the people that we put into these positions to represent us and what they do in turn, right, it creates a very scary set of circumstances where it's clear that, you know, our country is not being ran at, under the best interest of the people at large. So... It is kind of a scary concept to think about, you know, the world that you know it and the world you grew up in, the United States as we know it, you know, could it be on the downcline? And there's a lot of people that might be a little more pessimistic, Matt, mm -hmm. and they think, well, well, America is not the same America it was when I was a kid, right? I mean, I'm 37 years old. You're in your 30s, too. That's and right. You and I are about the same age. And, you know, I, I'm not exactly you know, um, long in the tooth yet, but I'm not a spring chicken either. Uh, so I kind of think we're sort of, uh, you know, represent a pretty large amount of people in the U.S. And this world that we live in here in this country is not the same it was when we were young. Most definitely. It has changed not. considerably. Yeah, it has. And, you know, you know, growing up in the 80s and the 90s, we've, our generation has had the, the luxury and the opportunity to kind of see that entire gamut of how it was intended to work and the the miscarriage of the republic that you spoke of. Um, and I guess the balkanization and secession, they're normal things that take place all the time, but in, the, in America, in the US, it has a negative connotation with it because of what happened with the Civil War. You can't say secede without somebody automatically jumping to the conclusion of the South and the reason why they seceded. But that's that's just one part of time. But to say that the reason that someone wants to do that now is the same reason would be incorrect. Um, there's a ton of reasons and 
a good example of that, I was looking it up is um, there was an organ in, in Idaho. So currently to date, there's five counties in Oregon that petitioned and are voting to secede from Oregon into Idaho, counties that are close to the border. So why would they want to do that? They want to do that because the balkanization mentality or the the definition being there is a reason that they clearly want to leave that state and they align more with the beliefs or how that's uh, how Idaho is being managed. So are they able to do that? If they if they vote on it and if they wish to do so, absolutely. I personally feel like they should be able to vote on that because those are the people they bought property in that area. And if those people vote to join a different union per se, that's their choice. And if they decide that they don't like it, it's not a binding forever agreement. They can say, well, you know what? We, we tried this. We tried that. Let's go back. There's nothing wrong with that. But the choice the American way of having a choice to do that and putting it in the to the vote of the people, um, that is is really what the republic stands for. And if you don't honor that, then really, who's the criminal then? If you said you bought this property, but you don't have any voting rights to what what happens to this property, is the ultimate miscarriage of the republic that I've seen. You know, it's a very uh, very great point that you made there, Matt, and and. You know, it does come down to population densities. And when you see um, all these situations, you can even look at it from a standpoint of um, just rewriting district lines in some cases, right? They want to, you know, and, and sometimes they'll they'll take and, and rewrite a district line in just a way that puts a population center a little bit mm-hmm. more in a direction where they get maybe that extra Senate yeah. seat or that Called extra house gerrymandering. seat. Gerrymandering. Yeah, gerrymandering. Yeah. So there's all of that that goes on in order just to try to, to tip that balance of power a little bit more, right? When we see uh, such a partisan view of politics from each side, right, where one side wants this drastically different view of the future of America and the other side wants this other drastically different view of America. And then you've got a certain amount of people that think one way and the other, it creates this rift and this divide. And in the middle, there's like this no man's land. And that's a very scary place to be. Um, That's not what our founding fathers intended. Our founding fathers never intended for there to be a multi-party type of situation. You know, they wanted each candidate, um, you know, to be voted on based on their merits and their flaws and their record and what people thought of them and everything individually, right? And there was even situations where, you know, I believe it was Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. They were at each other's throats for a long time, right? They, they were kind of rivals. I believe it was those two uh, specifically. I hope I'm right on that. <laughs> uh, look, I try <laughs> to be up on the history the as best as I can, guys. But, uh, you know, those guys were at each other's throats a good bit. And it wasn't until later in life that they finally reconciled and understood, you know, that each other you know, had the right to feel it the way they did. So... Um, there's always going to be a little bit of internal strife. I mean, what family doesn't argue, right? What family, even at a family reunion or dinner, doesn't have a tiny discussion about things that they might disagree with, right? Disagreement is normal, right? It's okay for us to talk these things out. It's okay to challenge each other's perspective on a given subject, right? The danger that comes in what is happening right now is we've never seen censorship at the level that it is right now with, with what's going on, right? Our Facebook page, for instance, was unpublished initially um, Memorial Day weekend, oddly enough. I I was going to make a Memorial Day post. I went on there, 800 plus thousand followers on Facebook, our Facebook page unpublished. Mm. Well, we went through a couple of people in the industry to try to get it back. I'm not going to say who, but he messaged me back and he's like, hey, I talked to my people at Facebook, some of the engineers, and they said they're not going to reinstate your account. They won't tell me why. So see, there's a danger in that, right, where, you know, initially like when social media first became a thing or actually i'll go back before it became a thing before social media was sort of the town hall uh section of the internet right it was still a new thing back when google still uh well when youtube was still youtube and wasn't owned by google right you know right now youtube is owned owned by google that's fine 
But when YouTube was in its infancy, I remember when Facebook was still very young. I mean, I remember MySpace and some of the early uh, social media platforms. When it had the in front of Facebook. Yes. The Facebook. Exactly. Like OG so Facebook. So early on when they're trying to build this big, crazy thing, right? It's a, you know, hey, come on, come one, come all. Come on over here. Everyone's welcome. You know, hey, we want, I remember like the original mission statements, you know, they want everyone to have a voice and to be able to, you know, reach their people and grow an audience and grow a following. And that seems like such a welcoming environment, right? Like, well, well, great. That's what, what we want. We want a fair place on the stage for everyone to, you know, be able to voice their grievances and concerns and interact with each other and have a great time and, and just share ideas and just meet common-minded, you know, like-minded people. That's how it started. But now as, you know, large government and big corporate interests, okay, and big tech have seen that, well, wow, we've got these average people who... We didn't give them this power. Uh, they just garnered this uh, viewership just by being them. And they don't like that. They've realized the dangers of allowing average people to get what traditionally would be power that would only be bestowed by people that have the ability to bestow it, that size of an audience or that size of a platform. You see all these blue checks on Twitter and everything. They've got these you know, grossly um, exaggerated numbers in their accounts that you know are not real followers yep. like that that's being interjected to make them look more important and more astute than they really are and there's a lot of that that goes on right and the same thing with facebook you know i was stuck at like eight hundred twenty-five thousand followers for like six years straight it didn't move either direction up or down and you mean to tell me that eight hundred thousand eight hundred twenty-five thousand people followed my facebook page and then it just stopped right they stopped it right so that's what's scary I'm not. I'm not saying that. Well, I am sore because it makes me <laughs> mad that we spent all that time to to garner that audience and to grow a great community, and then it's when the blink of an eye, it's gone. Now, why does that? Why does that come into play in this subject? Why am I even mentioning this? I'm mentioning this because these are the seeds that sow such discontent with the general population, where you've got one group of people that's completely okay with the concept of the government controlling every aspect of their life. They're okay with big tech censoring people they don't agree with. Hey, for them, as long as it's somebody they hate and they disagree with, they don't care if I'm gone off social media because they hate me anyway. And the people that are okay with that, they're going to look the other way. And of course, because it, it, my political views don't align with them, they're completely okay to do that. They're okay with big tech doing that. Now, the danger in that is when a group of people is completely removed from the situation, right? Like, imagine we all built this mansion together, all right? And the people that had the land for the mansion said, hey, if you help us build this mansion, everyone can have a room in it. Hey, we'll all share this. And it's cool. Like, it's, it's all our place to all exist and cohabitate and all be happy together. Imagine having your hands bloody to, to, the, to the bone, carrying the stones and applying the mortar and doing all the work to build the house. And then when the house gets built, they go, well, we changed our minds. This is a pretty cool mansion. And, you know, I appreciate the hard work, but, you know, we're just going to have to ask you to go somewhere else and go build your own mansion because this is just too nice to share with you. That's what the equivalent of it is, right? Being kicked out of the door when you thought you were welcome. So in a way, it's kind of false advertising. Anyway, we're not going to get into the minutia of uh, all of this section uh, 230 and all of that mess. We're not going to get into that. But the point is, is that it does drive a rift between people, both politically and also just, uh, you know, morally and principally in, in their everyday life, right? So we look at these situations and we go, well, well, what did I do wrong? Simply just having an opinion that differs from yours is enough reason to, you know, try to ruin my existence and, and keep me from reaching my followers. So I wanted to mention that and spend a little bit of time on it because that's where a lot of people's minds are at. There's folks that are being censored, their posts are being pulled, they're being shadow banned, and there's an entire uh, sort of um, almost a, a monopoly that's being driven around information. There's a monopoly on information, there's a monopoly on social media platforms, and they are obviously uh, sort of having a bit of a, I guess, a, a biased view towards one side of the political equation while 
silencing the other side of the political equation. And you wouldn't expect an institution such as a large social media platform that is supposed to be sort of a meeting place, a town hall for all people to have an equal view, which is how it started out. You wouldn't expect them to go, well, we're picking a side and unfortunately you're not on it. So, all right, I may not be for balkanization. Sorry. I may not be for balkanization. However, it doesn't mean that they're not clearly trying to balkanize by what they're doing to the citizens uh, and, and what the government's doing, right? Even um, Plasky there, uh, the, the, the press secretary in the White House said that the Biden administration is working with social media platforms such as Facebook to remove dissenting voices that they don't agree with. Well, well wait a minute. That's, that's not the American way at all. And, and it's definitely not what the uh, social media platforms were put in place for initially, Mm-hmm. So I'm just saying it, it's a scary thing. Well, that's that's kind of how it starts. They start sowing those seeds of doubt in the public and they start controlling the narrative. But if you start looking at um, why balkanize or who, who wants to balkanize? Mm-hmm. Well, there's actually a um, referendum called Yes, California. that was uh, started in 2015. And that is a uh, PAC, Political Action Committee, that is for the secession of California. So that's what their goal is. And I personally think we should all get behind that and let them secede because that whole part of the country, California, and I'm sorry, Washington State, Eric, did you know that the largest listener base that we have is in Washington State? If we look at the metrics. So thank you, Washington State. We appreciate you guys tuning in and we appreciate you listening. But There is a ton of those states, Washington State, um, California, um, Seattle, Washington, like city states. If you look at the federal spending and the federal money that flows into those states for those public programs, Georgia, we're from Georgia, if you guys don't know, is paying for a good portion of that, unbeknownst to us, to the general taxpaying Georgian. So our money is not only going to Georgia State, it's also going to California and Washington and all all of those West Coast states that for some reason are getting no media airtime on what's going on. So we have to catch through Instagram and Facebook and YouTube videos of people just walking into stores and loading up grocery bags full of drugs at pharmacies and people are recording them and just watching them just steal shoplift bags yeah, and bags. They decriminalize petty theft and, and things like that. And they're just watching them because the police refuse to to enforce the law. And I mean, okay, I get it. Some laws are, are not constitutional, but stealing and shoplifting from a private business most definitely is. And yeah. for if that's morally acceptable... For those states, I dare you to come to Georgia and try that at one of our small businesses. Right. So again, when we discuss balkanization, and let's just say a a peaceful separation of of the people Mm -hmm. who think one way versus another, uh, look, if if you want to live in a place where you're going to open a business and someone can just walk in the door and steal everything and nobody's going to do anything about it, there's obviously a huge subset of people in this country, a huge Mm -hmm. subset, like 65, 75% of the people in this country are not okay with that, right? So if you want to just have your own little area to go do that, like move up to Washington State and go yeah. go up there and y'all can be weird up there. All right, I want to backtrack just for a second. Go for it. All right, this is Facebook's new mission statement. Ooh. This came out just this last June. Oh, it's, it's actually, if you read it, it's not a bad mission statement. All right, this is from Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, new mission statement is to give people the power to build a community and bring the world closer together. And he wants to do that through video, obviously. They're bringing on, you know, some good video programs. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm all about that. But zucking me is not that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I had a community, and they destroyed it because, obviously, they disagree with me, even though I haven't, you know, um, violated any Mm -hmm. of their published, uh, you know, community standards and that's the difficulty right we look at twitter recently jack dorsey um just deleted the two arizona audit pages off of twitter Mm -hmm. deleted their pages yep so so that's some scary stuff right and they claim that it's done in the name of preventing misinformation and everything like that but here's the thing 
if someone, all right, let's just say, I, I hate to, to call this person out because I, I, I love Babylon Bee. I really, really do. And I mean this in the most awesome way possible. <laughs> the Babylon Bee. But when you read a Babylon Bee article, you know that it's satire, right? Yep. It would never be meant to be taken seriously. Like it's the obviously onion. satire. But it's satire that's done with a political flair that gives you a little bit of an opinion on what's going on in the political world and points out like clear hypocrisy and things that are happening, but does it in a joyful and playful and witty and smart way. Yep. That's okay, right? Now, if someone tries to just blatantly put out some really terrible information, that's one thing. So then, now you've got this fact-checking stuff, which seemingly on the surface at, in the beginning seemed like an okay idea to keep people abreast of, of ideas. But the problem is now it's just turned into a giant propaganda type of thing where they, they misuse and misrepresent a lot of things to drive a very specific agenda, right? So... It's not misinformation. It's just information they don't agree with and they don't like. So that's the danger is when someone like, you know, Jack or someone like Mark Zuckerberg can just throw a switch and just completely, you know, keep someone out of the uh, narrative. Uh, that's very dangerous, right? Well, there's a lot of people out there that would go, well, well, why don't you just start your own social media platform? Well, people have tried. Look at what happened with Parler, right? right? They started Parler. What happened? They you know, went went in on the back end on Apple iTunes and they went through Amazon and they screwed that situation up and it has not bounced back and it never will. Yeah, the platform never really bounced back to its full potential. And Parler had some pretty uh, deep pocketed, uh, you know, investors to get that started. So it's not that people haven't tried to start their own social media platforms. All right, now let's fast forward to some other things that are happening. Look at PayPal now, who's just been given this edict from the government to, you know, uh, make a list of naughty people they disagree with so that they can, you know, close their PayPal accounts. And that's happened sort of in a soft t sort of situation in the past, right? Mm -hmm. Where gun companies have lost their ability to use uh, uh, things like PayPal uh, just simply because of the type of business they choose to be involved in, right? There's even been situations where people's bank accounts have been uh, closed because the bank doesn't agree with their, their choice of business. So again, it's not balkanization in the truest sense of geographical balkanization, like where this area is this person's area, that person is that person's area, but it's social balkanization where they're almost adopting like the Chinese social credit system in That's a way right. where they go, well, because you think this way and you do this and you do something that the huge establishment who happens to be in control right now really disagrees with and all of the really rich uh, you know, let's just say big tech people and all the big banking industry and all the folks in big business disagree with what you're trying to do. We're just going to make it where you can't obtain goods and services based on your individual thoughts and whims and wishes. And that's a very dangerous environment. So, all right, there may not be balkanization in the truest sense of the term, but it doesn't mean that you're not being treated as a second rate citizen as a result because of their ability to do those things. It's so true. And it's, it's funny you bring that up because I was uh, actually just talking to our credit card processor, we the processor .com. Uh, shame shameless plug. Um, <laughs> but they were letting us know that um, that's exactly what's happening. We were having some issues, um, I think two weeks ago processing and uh, they had to go in and make some changes. But all of the banks now, even though they had Operation Choke Point, which was the first thing that they did to try to choke out and smother a lot of uh, businesses, what they deem high risk, which would be anything firearms, ammunition, um, CBD, stuff like that, that the, the banks don't think in those states they have a problem with. Um, they're doing it again. So a, a lot of like family gun stores, a lot of like anybody that works with firearms or ammunition or, or anything pro freedom, really, they're they're having issues with their credit card processing. And mm -hmm. that's where it starts. And that's why it's so important as a for us as a community to come together and try to s solve these problems. And no, we're probably not going to have a, a all inclusive social media platform because it's already been established and they're just going to stamp you out like the little cockroaches that we are to them. Um, but all we can do is try to help each other as a community, whether we're business owners, small business owners, family business, doctors. I mean, you'd be amazed at how many people are pro-freedom and pro-gun that are in 
other industries like doctors. Uh, mm -hmm. A great example is like my uh, actors, actors, I musicians, mean, yes, a lot of them. There's so lots of them out there. They um, can't be vocal about it, but right. they're out there. But they'll give you the wink and the nod. You know, when I when I go in and see my, my family <laughs> doctor. Holiday. Yeah. I mean, they'll they'll come in, they'll ask, they're like, oh, what do you do? And I kind of give them the rundown and they're like, all of a sudden they start going from talking medical to talking shop and they're like oh i got this and i got that and i'm like okay <laughs> Rap it. yeah you know so i mean it's it all, you <laughs> know, Keanu <laughs> Keanu <Reeves. laughs> it's true yeah it's absolutely true that's um, a great point so we, we really have to to do our best as a community to to stop the infighting and, and try to help each other because i mean without it we're just going to tear each other apart i agree and i think that there's there's certainly a danger in supporting the division so I'm a little torn, right? Like, on the surface, it would appear, okay, well, balkanization could just immediately give people what they want in the short term. Not really, though. Not really. Because it's still going to be everyone's issue at the end of the day. We all share this continent, right? We live here. This is our home. We don't have to like each other, but this is the system we have in place. This is the government we have. And whether we like it or not, this is what we have to deal with, right? Right. It's our responsibility as citizens to make sure that we're holding all of our elected representatives, um, you know, accountable for their actions. Uh, I think there's, what, 545 people or something? That, Roughly. You know, something yeah. like that. About so 540, I believe. That, it's not a lot, right? So, I mean, <laughs> it, it shouldn't be too difficult to, you know, the issue becomes that these people get elected, they get on the Hill, they get a taste of that power, they get a taste of that influence, and they understand that they are they sort of become a, a part of a little microcosm of society that is very unique and yeah there's insider trading yeah there's all the things that they can do right when they pass these large budgets and stuff like right now they're talking about this other budget they're putting together it's like what four and a half billion or three and a half billion dollars mm -hmm. or something like that and they earmark all that money to all of their special interest groups so like you know, they go, all right, let's pass this huge bill, right? And then they don't even actually go up for a proper vote, right? The way that, that Pelosi has changed the rules in the House, it's very, very crazy the way that they pass some of these things and get them through the House. They don't even do recorded votes a lot of the times, and mm -hmm. that's what's so scary about it, right? We should be holding our elected representatives to a much higher standard and say, look, you know, you guys need to get together and vote on this. We want a recorded vote on Bill A, Bill B, Bill C, right? Every bill needs to be a recorded vote and it needs to be individual. None of this pork, yes, none of this stuff thrown it. together in a mixing pot where they can just go, well, we, we did a we did a roll call vote, there it is, whatever. That, that's not good enough. We need a recorded vote on every single individual bill it needs to be voted on as an individual piece of legislation because you need to know what a person's voting and track record is going to be so you know if you're going to reelect them or not. Right. So let's just say you have a, um, a, uh, a, I guess you'd call her a freshman senator, you know, or, or, or congressman, whatever, you know, a freshman politician who it's like their first stint, like Marjorie Green right yep. here in, in Georgia. And she's made her, her case clear. Like she, she's a very pro freedom kind of lady and everything. I can respect that. Some of her views, a little out there maybe, but I, I do think that she has a good heart and, and she means well. Right. But you look at guys like Thomas Massey. He's very frustrated that Congress just refuses uh, to have a recorded vote on a lot of things. And he's right. They should go for a recorded vote on individual pieces of legislation so an individual track record can be established for a person's voting record. That's the only way you're going to know where they really stand on every individual issue. Right. When you have a three and a half billion pork package, a three and a half billion dollar pork package put together that they're then going to take and divvy it out to all their special interest groups and all of their, you know, random little black projects and all the little buddies they can slip some money under the table to to do God knows what. You know, that's dangerous, right? So it becomes them taking our money and then doing it to further their individual needs as a small group of people instead of the needs of the public at large. And that's the danger, right? So what more is the definition of balkanization than being uh, taxed but not represented? How That's can right. you be represented if you don't know the voting record of the people that you elected? And I think that's a that's right there is sowing the seeds of balkanization. Whether we want to, you know, it's almost like the Cold War version of what balkanization is, right? A Cold War is the idea of something starting out as just saber rattling and maneuvers. And, you know, you think, well, is this really happening? Like, nothing's gone kinetic yet mm -hmm. in a Cold War, right? 
we we lived through a cold war obviously and there's all types of stuff like that 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 happens right so what we see is a cold balkanization that's happening right now where the seeds are being sown for the ideas of these things to occur they are laying out the foundations social credit systems vaccination passports mandatory vaccinations medical tyranny all right all of these things are the type of ideas that you see in communist nations and socialist nations like people that don't have rights <clears throat> and that's scary right we are a nation of laws and rights we have a constitution we have a giant list of things that the government can't do that's what the constitution is the bill of rights all those things it's not a list of things that we can do it's a list of things the government can't do and when they ignore that list and just do what they want you start to wonder like what's really going on here and I, th I think that's the overall gist of how people are feeling right now totally and when you look at the the workload versus the salary of someone in the house of representatives or the or a senator i looked this up and you can look it up as well if you go to the the website for congress it gives you the calendar for the entire month it tells you what days the house of representatives are in in session what days the senators are in session it's only 12 days out of the month that either house is in session so for 12 days worth of work they make a hundred and seventy four thousand dollars for yep. tw for 12 days worth of work they take two breaks a year and they can't even agree on specific spending packages without cramming pork in there because they only have 12 days to get it done it blows me away to think that there are people in the general public that are okay with this right so like diane feinstein has a a villa on lake tahoe that's worth 41 million dollars mm. Now you look at how long someone like feinstein or pelosi or, or any of them right i don't care what side of the political political spectrum democrat republican name it whoever establishment um let's just say long-serving establishment politicians you know they generate a ton of personal wealth and it seems to be the over the overall reoccurring theme is that not only do they generate wealth they generate a lot of wealth a so ton. how do you do that on a hundred seventy four thousand dollar salary there's all the inside trading and all the pork and all the black projects mm -hmm. and all of the elbow rubbing and military contracts and the military industrial comp complex you know the uh, prison system complex where you've got private prisons that generate tons of revenue you know there is an entire business that involves you know them uh going to war and there's an entire business that involves them incarcerating people and it's a it's a money-making thing and there's all these contracts and all private these classes jets. yeah private jets yeah like to fly back and forth because they don't want to fly coach on a hundred seventy four thousand dollar salary correct i mean you could fly comfort plus so there's a danger in that right <laughs> the 22nd amendment is what established term limits for presidents so if we deemed the most important office that we have uh, to need term limits, then why not have term limits for uh, politicians as well, for senators, you know, and uh, congressmen, things like that. So there is a danger in in letting someone obtain 50, 60, well, I mean, Biden's almost, what, 50 years yeah, of political 40, power. 48, yeah. 48 yeah, years. it's a long time for someone to be in politics and then claim to want to be able to fix everything, but after 48 years hasn't fixed a single thing. In fact, have caused tons of problems, right? We won't get into that. That's not what this is about. But it does sow the seeds. That's right. Of balkanization in a lot of people's minds, and and I think that your average American at large does not want balkanization. They want, uh, you know, the nuclear family. They want a traditional American family. You know, work hard, pay your taxes, do what you need to do, live your life, make a good living, take care of your kids, do cool stuff, and and live life and just be free and and value your free time you know and and have the absolute minimum amount of taxes possible right well i i very much disagree with taxes I, but we won't get into that either that's not really what this uh, podcast is about i want to change direction here and i want to talk about edward snowden and uh so this article was put up on his twitter page uh july 27th which was just yesterday yep and uh, i'm not going to get into too much on it uh, but let's see here. All right. This is the paraphrasing the article. 
The text made no sound. It produced no image. It offered no warning of any kind as an iMessage delivered malware directly onto her phone and passed Apple's security systems. The title of the article is, We Need to Talk About the Insecurity Industry. So one thing that Edward Snowden talks about so much is all the snooping that the government does on a regular basis. Now, you, you remember earlier when we talked about ExpressVPN, you know, having a separate, um, you know, a layer, a, of security. a layer of security is always great, you know, to, to help, you know, protect your overall uh, communications and things like that. The sites you're going to, that's no one's business what you're looking at. But here we have malware that can actually be installed on your phone simply by pulling up, uh, you know, a text that has the the malware in it. And the private um, the private spyware that's used is actually done through a, a NSO group, and it's called the Pegasus spyware. So mm. they put this Pegasus spyware on your phone, and then they can basically track all your movements. They they know what your phone knows. Like there's a microphone on this phone. Right, it picks up everything you're saying. They know what you're texting. They know what you're emailing. They can record your phone calls. That's scary, right? So again, getting into this idea of this huge separation in people's overall ideas and how they view freedom and how they view, uh, you know, their privacy. Right? Again, not to say that balkanization is literally happening, but the seeds of balkanization, yet again, when it comes to the surveillance are also being put in place, right? People don't want the government snooping in on their business, right? Especially when the same government is completely okay with, you know, removing an entire subset of people from the, 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 the uh, I guess we would call it the political stage or the, the public stage, right? So what's going to happen when they put this giant database together and they can look for keywords of things that you've said that they disagree with. And then, all right, well, because they have this Chinese-style social credit system, now you can't obtain goods and services. You can't mm -hmm. open a bank account. You can't have a social media page. You literally don't exist, right? What? You can't even go to the grocery store and buy groceries? Or they, they apply some naughty person tax to you that you get taxed some exuberant amount of money because they disagree with you? Or, oh, now you can't get a government job. You can't get... Uh, certain types of jobs in certain sectors that that is a very real consequence of all of these of allowing these things to happen and those sow the seeds of balkanization yep and that's um i think that reminds me of a black mirror episode with uh john ham you might uh know him from the show mad men that's at least that's how i remember him he was in an episode of Black Mirror where they had like this, uh, it was in the future, like most of them are, and he basically had to get inside someone's head and convince them to make a confession for uh, murdering somebody. And But he was a criminal himself, and if he was able to get that confession from that criminal, uh, he would go free. So he, he was successful, but at the end, uh, he got basically tuned out of society so when he went back out into the world he couldn't see anybody he, everybody was kind of fuzzy and if you watch the episode you'll you'll know what i'm talking about but basically they set him loose and he's free to go and do with, do whatever he wants but he can't actually interact with anybody because of his past uh grievances and the past things that he's done and he's been convicted of so it's like a, a double-edged sword they're like sure you're you you got what we wanted you're free to go yeah, it's almost like the pre-crime idea yeah. in like minority yeah. report that movie if you've but, ever seen but we're it. not going to let you talk to anybody nobody can see you you can't buy anything but you can yeah. go out and do whatever you want so yeah, and you think about like the the people that the government winds up using right and then mm -hmm. once they're done with them and they've, they've served their purpose they throw them to the curb or, or they throw them under the bus when it comes to uh, either professionally or uh, whatever, socially. You know, they the media writes all these hit pieces about people to try to make people think they're the devil and everything like that. So there's all this random things. You think about the power that social media has, the power that the media has, the power that big tech has. That's a very dangerous thing for them to harness against people that simply just have a differing point of view, right? I mean, do we not have the First Amendment? Do we not have freedom of speech? Some would argue, well... These people are businesses and they can do what they want. But then when the White House press secretary says, well, we're working with big tech to censor voices that we disagree with or to remove misinformation, but it's not misinformation. It's just a differing opinion. So which is it? You can't have your cake and eat it too, right? You can't say, well, a private business can do what they want, but then the government literally, it, it's been proven that there's like a couple of little uh, like areas 
that the government can send like a, a, a support ticket into Facebook or Twitter or whoever, and there's a team at the social media companies that can remove posts at their wish. Well, that's not that's not cool, right? So at that point, it becomes a you know a government institution, right? If if social media is controlled by the government, even if in a tiny way and and geared towards a very specific group of people, well then they are beholden to the First Amendment. That, right. that, that that is a First Amendment issue. That's not a private business anymore. That is a that is a a government partnership, right? They are a government contractor at that point. So there's a lot of scary things that happen like that. And I will m- mention here uh, that I'm not saying that this is necessarily that I'm okay with this being a one-sided thing, right? I wouldn't want a Republican-controlled Congress and House and presidency to have that ability either. I just want everyone to have an open voice, no matter what their their opinion might be. So I'm not trying to say that I'm okay with one person being censored and another another one not. All right. So it, the thing is, I just want everyone to have an, an an open platform to be able to say what they want and and everybody just have a place, right? So if the things that I say on Facebook, for instance, right, the reason that they canned my Facebook page wasn't necessarily because I'm a gun channel, but for reasons that they wouldn't specify. But if my ideas are so bad, what? why do they need to censor me? Why, why do they need to pull me off their platform if my ideas are so wrong? It's not because they're wrong. It's because they know I'm moving the needle That's right. on, on, on concepts that they don't agree with. The articles that I shared right before my Facebook page was unpublished, at 800, uh, over 800,000 people, was stuff about David Chipman. Now what do we see? All right, the articles that I shared about David Chipman and his derogatory comments about African Americans, now the, some people within the ATF have come and they have corroborated mm-hmm. those, those views, and now they have proven that to be true. Right. But Facebook said, oh, that's, dis- that's misinformation. So did they pull my account because of the misinformation, which is now being corroborated as true? They knew I was right then, but they, yep. they banned me anyway because of the damage I was causing to their overall, um, let's just say, political goals, right? I was a fly in the ointment. And someone in the Biden administration said, this guy's a fly in the ointment, get rid of him, and they did it. I can't prove it yet, but when I do... Well, it's going to get interesting. Well, I remember that. And that, it's that coming was... out, right? It's more of this information is coming out day by day. Mm-hmm. It's only a matter of time before they get, they're, they're going to get slapped on the wrist big time. And they're, they're all going to get broken up. Just like the phone companies, right? Got broke up over the, the whole, you know, monopolies yep. of Southern, phone companies. Southern Bell and mm-hmm. all that. Yep. And I'm telling you, if they're not careful, they're going to ruin a good thing. And they're going to get broken up. And it's not going to be pretty for any of us. Well, I, I remember um, the Chipman article. It was revolving around uh, promotional tests for um, everybody. But then I think there was a very high amount of African-American agents that passed the test. And he said they must have been cheating. So that, I mean, yeah. when I saw that, I was like, ooh, that's, that's not going right. to be good. So, <laughs> so the fact was, it's not that what I said was incorrect. It's that what I said was very damning. Yep. And they didn't like it. So they, put, they kicked me off the platform. It's probably only a matter of time before I get kicked off Twitter. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. I mean, Instagram's threatened to throw me off several times. So what is it about me versus all the other talking heads, right? And this, this podcast is about balkanization. However, the censorship thing is a huge component of that, right? Right. When they remove dissenting voices, for instance, all right, let's just say a doctor. We're talking a doctor, right? Someone with a mm-hmm. you know medical degree, like they're a doctor. Whether you like it or not, they have an opinion, an expert opinion that they're entitled to. So let's just say you have 10 doctors and eight of them agree on something related to, let's just say, um, COVID or whatever, right? But then two of them don't. So what? You delete the, the Twitter pages of the two doctors that disagree with your opinion and you censor the two that you don't agree with and say that it's information just because they don't agree and then say, well, all the doctors agree now. See, that's the danger, Right. Mm-hmm. Everyone should have the opportunity to be heard and to have an open platform where they can all share their ideas. And if those ideas are terrible or they're incorrect or they're riddled with misinformation and all kind of random weird crap that people don't agree with, then they're going to self-regulate. People are going to self-regulate. They're going to call people out on it. They're going to go, hey, that's bull crap. Here's why. I did my research, right? It's okay to do your research. We're even seeing situations now on social media where all these talking heads are saying, oh, you don't need to worry about doing any research. You That's just need right. to accept yeah. this 
as the uh, as the, the 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 token position on this, and you don't need to question that. Like this is the position, this is the narrative, and you you accept it and move on. That's, That's what they scary. want. That's scary. Yeah, because they're totally saying you're not smart enough to do their own research. Leave that to the leave that to the scientists that that are on our side. They're going right. to peddle the information to you and provide you with a narrative that we want them to provide you. If I was so wrong, why do why do I have eight hundred thousand people follow me on on Facebook? Correct. If I'm so wrong, or are they following me just to go, wow, this guy's an idiot and laugh yeah. at me? No, <laughs> they're well, following me them. because they some like what them. I have to say. So <laughs> that's the danger is when someone garners an audience and then they go, ah, that audience, we don't like, you know, we don't like what they're saying. We don't like the information that's being put out. Mm -hmm. We don't like the minds that they're changing. Bye. You're gone. You're out of here. Well, that, doesn't, look, that doesn't coincide with that mission statement. Well, well look that's at false advertising. Look at the the audience that you have at 825,000. Let's just say if you would have kept growing, if Facebook would have allowed it, you would have been at a million. According to Nielsen ratings, that million followers would have had more of an impact than, say, CNN, uh, a regular newscast. Because they, according to the Nielsen ratings, they might only get 1.5 to 2 million on a good night versus right. you pushing out a, a news article at like in 30 seconds boom, and being able to plaster it to the same size audience that somebody would have to tune in to a nightly newscast to get, right. you're providing it in 30 well, seconds. The danger, the danger in that to them and their mind, and again, this is related to the balkanization idea because the danger in that becomes that, oh, well, we didn't give you that audience. That's not yours. Like You, you, know, you can't have that unless we give it to you, and that's the danger. That's why social media is so powerful, right? They don't like average people obtaining something that traditionally – has to be bought. Mm -hmm. You have to buy your way in. You have to know the right people. You got to be a part of the cabal. You got to be a part of the club. And if you're not, you're an outsider, right? That's why they hated Trump so much. Like it or not, he was an outsider and they couldn't handle it, right? They couldn't stand the idea. No one saw that bullet train flying down the tracks that happened in 2016. Nobody. <laughs> and it upset their power uh, pyramid. It toppled it. It disrupted it. And they could it. not stand it. So that is what we're seeing the results of. We're seeing the backlash of someone like Trump becoming president. You may not like him, but at the same time, you have to understand that he is not a part of the club. It never was. And you may not agree with everything he's ever done. And you may not like him. And sure, he's got some mean tweets. But you know what? I would take the mean tweets back in a heartbeat. You know, it's just, it's just crazy to think about. We woke up in a, in a, in a world today where these people can just censor whoever they want. It's like we're living in a communist state. And, and that's a very scary thing. So again, with balkanization, all right, you've got some people are completely okay with us becoming communists, right? They want it. They, they try to further that goal. They, they plant the seeds of that, right? They, they do what they can to make this nation that. But then you've got a lot of people that completely disagree with that. You know, they want a capitalistic, uh, you know, uh, a constitutional republic, you know, a traditional American society like we've always had. So when you've got two very, very, very different sides of a coin, it creates a huge rift, as we said in the beginning of the podcast. So well, it's scary. You know who you know who has an issue with that would be the Cubans. The Cubans that are fleeing Cuba right now. I have never met a Cuban that even thought about voting blue because they have firsthand experience on what's going on, which brings up a point of why are we not helping? And we're not helping the Cuban people at all. It's almost like we're more as, as a country, the administration is more into helping immigrants, illegal immigrants crossing the Southern border than they are people floating on rafts for 90 miles. 90 nautical miles is how far Cuba is from uh, Q, from Key West or the, the Florida Keys. That's it, 90 miles. So they're getting on these rafts, floating across open water. They're landing in Miami, by the way. They're, it's only 90 miles from the Keys, but it's about- They're risking their life. It's about 1,400 miles to the Miami beach. And these families, children, taking that chance to get away from communism, they will, when they hit land here, they, you will never, ever, see them complain about the administration when it's a red administration, not a blue one. It's pretty scary. I mean, 
when you see these people that are risking their life to come here, I mean, they get on these boats. I mean, look, the, the ocean's They're not scary. even boats. They don't classify them as boats. They're right. like floating pieces of driftwood. That's right. I mean, you know, that's a, the ocean is a scary place, guys, you know, and it's dangerous, right? You know, some bad winds kick up. You get some five, six foot seas. It's scary, right? The Gulf, the weather changes a lot. You know, these people are risking their lives to escape a government that wants to enslave them, essentially. And, you know... I sympathize with that greatly, and I sympathize with the idea that, you know, people have different views on immigration and things like that, and I understand that, and, and I'm not trying to get into these specific things too much, but when we look at what we've built as a country together, is it perfect? It's not. It's not perfect. I mean, there's been a lot of things in our history that I really regret and I hate and I disagree with, and I wish that we could go back and take it back and change it, but the fact of the matter is, we can't, right? We're here. We live here, we have to live together, and we have to make it work. And I think that it's in our best interest to make it work, because divided, right, we can be conquered easily when we are divided, right? Look at what happened General Custer, Battle of uh, Little Bighorn, right? Uh, the, the natives called it the Battle of the Greasy Grass. Yeah, man, they got waxed. He divided his forces. He got beat. If he wouldn't have divided his forces and waited on, I think they were waiting on Gatling guns. He was, ah, we can, we can handle it. No, you can't handle it. So mm -hmm. that's the thing, right? So you never divide your forces, right? We are a force for good. We are a force for liberty. We care about each other. We care about American values. We care about our country. We care about the well-being of people in our country, even those we disagree with, all right? I may not agree politically with everybody. They may not like me or agree with me politically, uh, but I think it was Voltaire that said— um, I disagree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And you got that right. That was and, and, and that's absolutely true. Like, we have to be willing to hold a higher standard for our country that goes above our personal needs, right? We have to put our country's needs first. And we have a system that's the most genius system ever devised, right? Constitutional Republic is great. You know, we've been doing great with it, but we have allowed our elected representatives to run rampant and uncontrolled and to abuse their power. And that's the danger. It's not the millions and millions of people that need to separate for the better good of each other. It's really the 545 or whatever it is people uh, that really, you know, we need to hold those people accountable. We're letting the few control the many by controlling the media and controlling the flow of information and that's a dangerous set of circumstances that we shouldn't support. I 100% agree. And when you start looking at balkanization or secession, it gets thrown around a lot. And a lot of Americans don't understand the ramifications or the repercussions of doing so. The idea sounds good. But to me, an ideal country would be low taxes or no taxes we have to work out how that would happen with like infrastructure and whatnot and public services. Obviously, we, those have to be provided um, at a certain level uh, to the general public. Um, and you guys can say anything you want. You need public. You need water. You need infrastructure. When you turn the faucet on, you want water to come out. You want the trash to be picked up. Is it, is it mandatory? No. Is it convenient? Absolutely. It is 100% convenient. I saw a video on TikTok the other day uh, that, that kind of affected me a little bit. It was a, it was a Russian man that moved to America, and he was like, "Well, you know, we're in a, in a thick Russian accent, which I'm not going to dare <laughs> attempt to replicate." But he was like, "Look, you know, everybody talks about America being so bad." He's like, "Look at this," and he goes over to the faucet and he goes, "Look, I got cold water, I got hot water, I got a big screen TV on the wall." I've got a car in my front yard. I've got a yard to play in and for my kids to play in. I've got a house. I've got a roof over my head. I have a washer and dryer. I have a refrigerator. I have a microwave. It's like all of these things that we take for granted, right? All of this technology and even just basic infrastructure that we all take for granted is a luxury in other parts of the world. And, you know, while I do very much disagree with, you know, the income tax was always supposed to be temporary. Mm hmm and it's a funny thing going around, right, that when we give the government some power, it's like they always say, oh, well, this is temporary, right? We just need to have this mask mandate for a little while, you know, just seven days to slow the spread. Yeah, so seven, fifteen, all temporary 100. power the government claims never winds up being temporary, and income taxes was always meant to be a temporary thing. 
And of course, you know, they see dollar signs, they see power, and they climb that pyramid and they get to the top of that pyramid and see all their subjects that make up the brick and the mortar and they just simply can't let go of it. And that's part of the issue with this whole thing is we've created a different class of people that think that they're above us when they're supposed to be our elected representatives. We pay them. Our tax dollars pay their salary. And I think that we should shoot for as low a tax as possible to still maintain. I mean, yeah, look, right? If someone gets an accident on the side of the road, you want to have services that can come and, you know, make sure, you know, help you deal with a wreck or, you know, take you to the hospital. I mean, yeah, there's certain things like that that we want to maintain. You want to make sure that your, you know, uh, your water and all of those systems are handled. So there's certain logistical things within society that, yes, taxes will handle like, you know, you need to certainly make sure that the roads can get fixed. I mean, all right, I'll give you an example. Shoot. There's one area that I've been driving through for about the last 20 years, okay? And the same pothole has been in the road for 20 years. And you're going to sit there and tell me that you collect tax money. Oh, well, it fixes the roads. And the same pothole's been there for 20 years. Come on. Don't lie to me. You know what I mean? Don't bullcrap us. Right. If you're going to collect the taxes and say it's done for a certain purpose, then it needs to be for that purpose. And the, and the tax money that gets taken in, it, there shouldn't be some political roundabout that occurs. Oh, let's come up with all these black projects and pork and let's find a way to essentially extort the people. That's right. And take this money and, and, and do what we need to with it, but under the guise of helping the public. That's all it is. It's all smoke and mirrors. And that's what's so dangerous about it. Yeah, we're allowing the, it to happen. There's, it's very little accountability. When you start getting into public funds, there's so many ways to mismanage that legally um, that it makes it very difficult to track it. And there are watchdog groups out there that kind of go into it and they really try to track down, they quote, follow the money uh, to make sure that everything is being appropriated correctly. But at the, and that's at the local and state level. So it's a little bit easier. But when you start getting into the federal level where you're talking about budgets of trillions of dollars, it's impossible. And then, and the lawmakers know this. It's they, an obscene amount They of know that you're not going to be able to track down every, every facet of a $1 trillion budget. So yeah. it, it's, it's, it's remarkable about what you can do and what you can't do when, once you get into office. And I am with you on term limits. I think, uh, I believe it was Ted Cruz that put forth a, um, he put forth uh, a plan for term limits and he tried to bring it to the floor within his constituents. No, they wouldn't have that. They were like, nah, man. <laughs> well, we are that. nearing the end of our podcast today. And I would just like to kind of end by saying that our founding fathers were very brilliant men. And I believe that they understood human nature. They understood that men were fallible and they did a pretty good job of laying down the foundation now, it, was it perfect? Were there people that, that certainly did not receive the maximum amount of that? Yes. Do I agree with it? Of course, I hate it, right? You know, the institutions that existed long ago, a lot of us hate it, and we wish it never would have happened. But um, overall, those the Founding Fathers were very smart, and they understood human nature, and they knew what men in power would do if given too much power. The people in control of this country right now are the people that our founding fathers wrote the Constitution for That's to right. stop them from doing what they knew they would do. They were really brilliant. They understood what would happen if power was left unchecked. That's why we have checks and balances. So something to think about. We hope that you enjoyed this podcast. I know we dove into some different stuff. Uh, I know we always get in the weeds on a few different subjects, right. but I think this was a good one. I think so. I think we had a great conversation and yeah. I was excited about it. Good to be back. And uh, we really appreciate you guys uh, listening in. If you're listening on the podcast, leave us a nice rating. It helps us show up in the uh, search results a little bit better. Also, if you're watching here on YouTube, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. If you want to support the podcast directly, you can check out ExpressVPN. Um, if you're on YouTube, you'll see our link below. Uh, or you can go over on Ballistic Inc. and pick yourself up a snazzy t-shirt. Those funds are certainly well appreciated and help us put together this content. Uh, have a good one. We've got many more podcasts and videos on the way, whether you're uh, tuning in on YouTube or on Apple Podcasts or the other podcast platforms. Thank you for watching and or listening. Bye, everybody. Have a great weekend.
Thanks for listening to Life, Liberty, and Pursuit. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are found. Be sure to leave us a five-star review. We'd really appreciate that. You can support us over on Ballistic Inc. by picking yourself up some merch. And remember, guys, dangerous freedom. Have a good one.